as I often like to do, let me start this with a story. It takes place a long, long time ago in long forgotten year of 1995. Oklahoma City? In for a big surprise that year. And as it turned out, so was I. I guess rather than I, I really mean my sister. You see, the specifics are a little bit fuzzy because I was one at the time, so forgive me for that. But the important part is that it was Christmas time. There was snow on the ground and this overwhelming feeling of good cheer. And like we did every year, we spent Christmas Eve at my aunt's house. And as was tradition, my sister and all of our cousins opened their Christmas presents from all of our extended family. And much to her excitement, and trust me, what was the overwhelming and all-powerful burning rage of our mother? My sister opened her gift for my aunt. It was a simple black box with a large red three on it and a little dragon in the middle. Yeah, my aunt had gifted my seven-year-old sister Mortal Kombat 3 on the Super NES. Little did I know at the time, because again, I, I was one. I didn't know anything. But this would be really important to us. Not only did this lead me to playing Mortal Kombat from literally the time I was old enough to hold a controller, again, much to my mother's chagrin, but it also led to this lifelong love of fighting games. When I was five, my family started taking this yearly trip where we'd spend a week at this campground, which, considering we basically lived in a trailer park year-round, was kind of a redundant vacation, but... Either way, my parents wanted to get drunk in the woods with their friends, and we got to reconnect with nature or whatever. But this campground had an arcade, and it had all the classic campground games. It had a ping pong table, an air hockey table, that little basketball game with the one hoop that you pay 50 cents to play, despite the fact there was an actual real-life basketball court feet from the door to the arcade. But... It also had a cabinet for a little game called X-Men vs. Street Fighter. So, of course, myself, my sister, all of our friends, we spent a majority of those vacations in that room at that cabinet. So, with all that said, believe me when I say I've been obsessed with fighting games since the literal minute I could play games. And the Marvel vs. Capcom series, it has a really special place in my heart when it comes to those. So today, I want to discuss the fourth titled game in the Marvel vs. Capcom series came out in 2017. It kind of released without any fanfare or honestly any marketing. I didn't even know it existed until months after it released on Steam because it advertised to me that it was on weekend sale. And so kind of out of like shock and a little bit of excitement, I just jumped on it. It was only while it was installing that I actually looked up reviews for the game I bought and saw that people had been talking about it, but not in a good way. So, without further delay, let's have a talk about game design. Let's talk about the struggles of publishing and the crushing boot of corporate tie-ins. I am the Cardboard Robot, and this is Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, a retrospective. So, real quick, for this review, I played the Steam version, so that's the only version I have for reference. Secondly, I'm going to be using the same rules for judging that I did with my uh, Dark Souls retrospective. They are the following. One, I'm going to try to review and analyze the game as though it's my first time playing it, which honestly this time isn't that far off from the truth. Two, I'm going to be giving the game a preliminary score before breaking it down to compare to later. Again, I played very little of this game when it did come out, so my preliminary review is going to be very brief. And three, I'm going to point out things that are like artistic choices, whether they look good or bad in regards to how they're designed. I'm not going to be discussing how the game looks in regards to graphics. I don't care about graphics. It does not impact whether the game is fun or well designed. So let's move on to the preliminary review. As a big fan of the MVC series, I honestly felt really disappointed with this one. Gameplay feels simplified and repetitive, which is really a deadly talks into a fighting game. I also found the roster really uninspired and lacking as compared to the other MVC games. I, I don't hate it, to be fair. It just didn't capture me like other games in the series. And once I put it down, I really not once had the urge to pick it up again. I'd give it a 4.5 out of 10. So I wanted to go over real quick kind of the history of Marvel vs. Capcom, but I kind of feel outclassed. I played the other games quite a bit, but Kind of only casually and sporadically, so I wanted to bring in a certified expert to give an overview. So without further ado, I present Uncanny Thor, a good friend of the Cardboard Nation and our resident Marvel vs. Capcom expert. Hey everybody, Uncanny Thor here. What brings me here today is I'm going to go down a brief history of Marvel vs. Capcom. I'm going to kind of jump right into it, into the year of 1992. While this is not 
traditionally a installment of the Marvel's Capcom series, but it must be noted that Street Fighter II Turbo, wow, tongue twister, really implemented the high impact speed, the crazy combos, and essentially people tweaked up the pace of the game. Capcom got a hold of this and like, man, we got to do that. And you know what? It happened. 1984 then is probably one of the more proper installments of X-Men Children of the Atom. It did well, licensed by Capcom, had a lot of fan favorites, Wolverine, Cyclops, Iceman, Storm. One thing to note is a secret character, Akuma, from the Street Fighter series, is in this game. So this was definitely paving a way. Then we hop into, I think, perhaps the true first installment of the series, 1996, X-Men vs. Street Fighter. Now we have a tag team element, so you have a partner. Uh, you can cross up with uh, a Street Fighter guy and an X-Men guy. You can have Ryu and Cyclops, Wolverine and Akuma, Charlie Storm. I want to move on to 1997's Marvel Superhero vs. Street Fighter. So now you have additions of Marvel superheroes now, like Spider-Man, uh, Blackheart, Shuman Garoth, etc., etc., one very major component introduced into this is assists. From this point on, assists are more or less an interval part of the Marvel's Capcom series. It was also considered the black sheep at the time. They really wanted to tone down the pace of the game. They were like, oh, let's not do the infinite combos and all the craziness and the wackiness on the screen. And they learned very shortly that is, we, we want that. We like that. Onward into 1998, which we had... Marvel vs. Capcom clashes superheroes. We got the craziness back. We got some fast-paced, tight moves. Um, roster has more Capcom implemented characters. I have Captain Commander, Strider, uh, Jin. Game overall has a special place in my heart. Um, I burned through a lot of quarters and a lot of memories as my childhood going into an arcade uh, down the shore for this. We have a two-year hiatus. Then we get probably the most critically acclaimed installment of this entire series. I'm talking about, of course, of Marvel vs. Capcom 2. New Age of Heroes. They upped everything. It's now a 3v3 tag. A 56-man roster. But unfortunately, this will be the temporary end of the partnership of Marvel and Capcom. But as for today, um, there's still a lot of love for this series. You can probably type something in on YouTube and you'll find, find plenty of cool clips. There's plenty of guys on YouTube that are pioneering this still, putting on a lot of good content. And the biggest thing that I want to say is that there's hashtag free MVC2. It took uh, the waves of Twitter that we want to get it out of jail. We, we want this game again. It got released in 2009. Why not again? You know, it's a well-beloved series. And, you know, I know that Marvel and Capcom's uh, relationship could be rocky at times. But you know what? We have a lot of love for this. And I like to say that, like, for someone who does have a lot of love for this, I am hopeful. And I have a dream that one day that maybe there'll be a new installment of Marvel with Capcom or... Maybe it'll be new ports. So I'll end this with saying a simple phrase that on Cyclops' victory screen of X-Men vs. Street Fighter, that dreams don't die. So there you go. Thank you, Thor, for coming on. With all that in mind, now we can properly move on to where it all went south. So things can clearly get complicated enough when the development team has to worry about appeasing the artistic vision of two separate and giant media companies. Especially when handling licensed content. What would make things easier? Why not add another one? Hell, let's add the biggest media conglomerate that we possibly could. Oh yeah, we're gonna talk about the fucking mouse. So Disney bought Marvel Entertainment in 2009 and chose to stop their licensing agreement with Capcom because they wanted to produce their own Marvel games without Capcom eating into their profits. And of course, these games flopped or never got made, which made Disney come back to Capcom to help develop a hit. There's a small difference between their previous relationship with Marvel, though, because now Disney had a giant say in the game's production. Well, why is that a problem, you might ask? Well, good question. Marvel vs. Capcom had always been a celebration of the two companies and their plethora of characters. But now... The game had to be direct advertisement for Marvel Studios and the Walt Disney Corporation, and any straying from the marketing team and Disney's vision, and they just pull the plug on the whole project. What does that lead to? Well, let's take a look back again at some of the other Marvel vs. Capcom games that led up to this one, just to give you a quick example. So X-Men, Children of the Atom unsurprisingly given the title, had its entire roster filled up with X-Men characters. A grand total of 12 playable characters. Marvel Super Heroes had a roster of 13 characters, almost a third of which were X-Men. X-Men vs. Street Fighter, again, unsurprisingly, had half of its playable roster filled with X-Men favorites. Now, Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter cut this back to only three X-Men characters in their roster of 17. And then Marvel vs. Capcom Clash of Heroes whittled this down again to only Wolverine and Gambit. But... 
it would feature a grand total of 10 X-Men characters as Marvel's 12 unplayable support characters. Now jumping to Marvel vs. Capcom 2, that would feature 28 fighters from Marvel Comics. 16 of which were X-Men characters. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom would end up featuring what would be so far the least X-Men representation, having only 7 of Marvel's 25 playable characters be from the X-Men series. Now that I've gone on this whole rant and you're all caught up, you may wonder, why bring up the X-Men and why bring up all the games other than the one I'm actually supposed to be talking about in this video? Well, personally, I'd love to talk about what X-Men characters are in Infinite and how they're represented and how they play. There's just one problem, though. Disney doesn't have the movie rights to the X-Men. Sony does. I mean, that wouldn't be a legal issue making the games. It never had been. Who cares if they have a long history inside the game? Who cares if the X-Men characters make up a bulk of fan favorites? Who cares about the actual commercial audience for the game? No, no, no. <laughs> Friend, we got movie tickets to sell. It was the executive producer at Marvel Games who planned to make the game dumbed down to make a super simplified version of the combat system so it was more accessible for a wider audience. And of course, by more accessible, he actually meant that he wanted to advertise more to children. And they consider children too stupid to be able to press two different buttons. It was also Marvel Games' decision to move back from the 3v3 fighting system to a simplified 2v2 because, well, they thought having to pick three fighters would just be too overwhelming for casual fans. Honestly, I, I really cannot stress enough how much contempt and disdain Disney has for the people who consume their products. They think the children, who make up a bulk of their consumer base, are quite literally the dumbest creatures on the planet. So much so, that they think the number three is too high for them to even fathom. They have such a low opinion of their own consumers, that they actually think having to press more than one button will absolutely obliterate their tiny Neanderthal minds. They also removed call and assist attacks in order to make the game more simple, and replaced it with the returning Infinity Stone system, which... Only as a coincidence, I'm sure, felt like a cheap gimmick that just so happened to tie into the Infinity Stone storyline that was all the rage in the MCU at the time. The removal of the game's trademark systems and anything that really made it fun or unique, it, it wasn't the only problem that working with Disney on Earth. Disney also had no plans whatsoever to properly fund the game, and then pushing this point forced the dev team to work on a budget that was half the amount Capcom had spent making the DLC for Street Fighter V. See the problem? So listen, I make it really clear in my rules that I don't care about graphics. And I mean it. If your game isn't graphically groundbreaking, I think there's still a lot of ways you can make your game look beautiful. My go-to example for this is Castlevania III. There are so many graphical and hardware limitations working on the NES, but they found a way to make a game that still has striking backgrounds and haunting visuals. That being said, if your game is ugly as fuck because of shortcuts and artistic choices, well, <laughs> we're gonna have a talk about it. Now, due to working on Disney's strict time frame with almost no budget, any characters who were returning from Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 had their model straight ripped from that game and haphazardly thrown into Infinite with little, if any, touch-ups and very little attempt to make them look like the newer models. And because of this, now not only is it strikingly apparent which models are new and which models are old, but also all the models look stretched out and horrible. People look like monstrous imposters. Don't think it, don't say it, don't think it, don't say it, don't think it, don't say it. Of their very recognizable selves. I mean, look at Chris Redfield here. Look at his inhuman neck that spreads out wider than his head. Look at his thighs that are thicker than his neck, that is thicker than his fucking head. He's a monster. He looks better in MVC3, because you know, that game, that model was designed for it. Here, you want another example? Look at Captain America in this clip, and tell me that he is a human person. Tell me, he is human-shaped. Tell me he is shaped like a human being, and not some sort of grotesque muscle monster that crawled straight from the deepest depths of the Uncanny Valley. You know, usually, I wouldn't even bother talking about the story in a fighting game. But honestly, the story mode... In Infinite is such a good example of the potential this game had if it was left in the hands of the actual creative team at Capcom. 
I say this because I really like the story. So here's how she goes, and there are going to be a few spoilers if for some unbelievable reason you care about that. Jetta from the Darkstalker series, makes a plan with the personification of death in the Marvel Universe. They're going to merge the Marvel Universe and the Capcom Universe together, which will cause mass death and somehow equalize the amount of people alive and dead in the two worlds. To do this, they're going to need the Infinity Stones, six stones of immense cosmic power that each control one essential piece of reality and life. To achieve the collection of these stones, Death manipulates Thanos, an extremely powerful titan who is extremely in love with Death, it's complicated, to find them for her. Yes, Death is also a woman. It's complicated. Read a comic book. Finding out that one of the stones is in the Capcom universe and in the hands of Sigma, a powerful android terrorist who strives to end all organic life, Thanos recruits Ultron to help him get it. Ultron, who is, of course, a super powerful AI, and a super villain who strives to end organic life. So they break into Sigma's lab. Upon Ultron and Sigma meeting each other, they immediately double-cross Thanos and steal the stone he already has, giving them two stones. They also go ahead with the whole convergence thing, and they fuse the two realms, and now they're fused, and they're Ultron Sigma now. Side note, I joke, but Ultron Sigma is such an awesome idea. Two giants of their own universes that have such a similar end goal and overall philosophies that them coming together makes so much sense and I love it. So, we actually start the story mode after these events and almost three months after the devastating events of the Convergence have already been seen. Ultron Sigma took over, he uses a modified version of the Sigma virus to turn organic life forms into machines that he controls. So the Marvel heroes and the Capcom staples alike gotta team up in order to launch a direct assault on Ultron Sigma's fortress. It does not go well, because Ultron Sigma is a fucking badass. I mean, look at him go. So, to beat him, the heroes must traverse through the converged landscape and work with Thanos to amass all the other Infinity Stones and build a super weapon in order to take Ultron Sigma down. And I'm actually not going to go into much detail here, because honestly, I think it's almost worth checking out. I mean, don't, don't play the game. Don't, don't go that far. God, no. But if you can find all, like, the cinema scenes on YouTube, give it a watch. There's a lot of good twists and turns, and it's a really good effort on the story writers to try to put, you know, some sort of nice bow on this bag of turds. Okay, here we go. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. The stuff that actually matters. How is Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite as a fighting game? I talk so much about all the stuff they took out, but what's left? Well, to really get that point across, I need to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is the X button. It's the only button you'll ever need to press. It's your auto combo button. You can get a little crazy. Maybe press another button in there from time to time. But if you want to win every fight, oh, you press that X button again and again. Now, doesn't that sound fun? Isn't that engaging and exciting gameplay for a fighting game? No. And are there more exciting, different ways to play? Yeah, kind of. There are proper combos in the game, but they're kind of wonky and they don't really flow well. And honestly, that all seems kind of pointless when there's an auto combo button. I was dreading getting to writing this part because the game is just so painfully boring. There's hardly anything to really say about it. It looks gross. The pacing sucks. The rounds are too fast, but feel slow somehow. All the characters that feel slow and clunky every round, you have to spend 20 seconds looking at a loading screen. Then you press X and jump for 15 to 30 seconds until you win, and then you spend another 20 seconds looking at a loading screen. The entire game is just a practice in tedium. Even the main boss of the game, which is Ultron Sigma's final form, named Ultron Omega, and it's supposedly his most powerful form. He's, a, he's Ultron sticking out of a big head. And it's the easiest fight in the game. He just sits there, he lets you wail on him every now and then, maybe he throws out a super telegraphed move that's super easy to block, and then you just wail on him some more. It's boring. And slow. That's another thing. <laughs> Even the gameplay feels so slow, and every character feels heavy and sloppy. How in the Sam fuck can you literally remove two characters from every round? It's 2v2 now. They remove two characters from around, and the game plays clunkier and slower than its predecessors. Let's go back and talk about the most glaring issue for me. The pacing and game feel in this game, because holy shit, the pacing's abysmal. Rounds for me usually lasted roughly 
20 to 30 seconds for each and each of them come with a loading screen that lasts 10 to 20 seconds and that might not seem a lot to you but that means an entire third at least of your playtime is looking at loading screens and to really punctuate this point here i'm gonna play an unedited clip it's a loading screen from infinite Now, imagine that every round you play, every, and I'll be conservative here and say minute, every minute of gameplay, you have to stare at that screen for 15 to 20 seconds, and it's essentially a blank screen. And if you still think, hey, cardboard robot, that's not so bad, well, here's the loading times one could expect from Marvel vs. Capcom 3 on a fucking PS3. Five seconds. Five fucking seconds from the last match ending to the next match beginning. Insane to me that a game could downgrade so far from the game that came before it. And from a game that wasn't even that well loved by its own community. And again, all this for what? All the loading screens and waiting for what? A game that was patched together like fucking Frankenstein on a shoestring budget, essentially kneecapped by the world's biggest media company. A fighting game with no interesting mechanics, stripped down to its very bones of anything unique or enticing to appease a denominator so low that it only exists in the warped mind of a Disney executive. With everything everyone loved from the earlier NBC titles, and essentially a one-button combo system, it plays like it was made in three hours using an Unreal Default fighting game config. And it has nothing, nothing to offer players other than a downright boring game that features everybody's favorite Disney-branded movie stars. But what do I think of the game? It sucks. It fucking sucks. I shit you not, when I was recording footage for this video, at one point I turned to my wife and I said, Damn, I'm sorry I've been playing for so long. And she got confused and said, What do you mean? So I respond with, What do you mean? I've been playing with my headphones on for like three straight hours. She looks me dead in the eyes and says, Cardboard, which is what my wife calls me. It's been 45 minutes. I was stunned. I was floored. How could this game be so bad that it slowed down time. It's the game equivalent of watching white paint dry. It's not visually exciting enough to be enticing, it's not fun enough to be engaging, and it's not even bad enough to be interesting. It's just flavorless slop you shove inside your eye holes because you can technically say you're playing a video game. Fuck! I could spend all day. All day, sitting here finding new and exciting ways to shit on this bland, lowest common denominator, milk toast, unambitious, corporately whitewashed, boring shit game. It's just nothing. My final verdict? 3 out of 10. 3 out of 10. If you like Marvel, its comics, or the other NBC games and want a pretty competent story, you go find someone on YouTube who uploaded all the cutscenes and you watch that. The decent storytelling... It's not worth playing this shit show for a second, and it certainly isn't worth even a cent of your money. Hey, big thanks to everyone who stuck through all the way to the end. If you like what you saw, it would really mean a lot to me if you could subscribe or at least give this video a thumbs up. If you want to see more of my content, please check out another one of my videos, or you can check me out on Twitch where I stream pretty regularly. Other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.